Hello, everyone. I'm your Commissioner of Public Lands, Hillary Franz, and I'm here today um, with a wonderful guest, Cisco Morris, who one of our preeminent, most amazing gardeners from around the world, uh, as well as with Ashley, our DNR Community Wildfire Preparedness Coordinator. Want to talk to you today about what we're already seeing in the context of wildfire and what you can do about it. So to date, we've already had 263 wildfires in Washington State, and it is only early May. Uh, we've had 70% of those fires east of the Cascades and 30% on the west. And to give you a context of how significant that is, usually around this time, a 10-year average, we have 103 wildfires. So we are expecting not only a difficult fire season, but a long fire season. And fact is, is you can do something about it. 90% of our fires are caused by humans, and much of our neighborhoods, our communities, are in, the con in a risk of high wildfire zone risk area. So today we have some of the greatest people from our agency and outside here to help you know what you can do to make your home and your community more wildfire resilient. Um, we've all learned over the last month plus how to create six feet of social distancing, a defensible space around our body from a global pandemic. And the fact is you can take your home and create that same six foot plus defensible space around your home so that it is less resistant to fire and more resilient to fire. And so want you to do everything you can, not only to keep your family and your community safe, but to keep our firefighters safe this year. And it starts right with you at your home. Ashley, why don't you share a little bit about what people can be doing uh, to make their home, their community more resilient. And then I can't wait to hear from Cisco today. Hi, thanks Hillary. Yeah, so as Hillary said, uh, the best thing that you can do is really start with your home. There's a part that you can definitely play to help keep our firefighters safe and to make your home more resilient. Uh, and that is really defensible space. The idea around defensible space is to create different practices and protocols around your home and on your home that are gonna make it more fire resilient. So this is things like using non-combustible materials for your siding, for your roof, creating a five foot fuel free zone around your home, but then also doing quite a few things in your landscaping. And really what we're trying to do is create pathways that have very little combustible material to no combustible material. And we're creating this separation both vertically and horizontally. Uh, we're really excited to have Cisco give us some great tips and tricks of how you can really make this landscaping beautiful while also making fire resilient. Some people have the idea that this has to be a moonscape around your house, and that's definitely not the case. You can have a really beautiful fire resilient yard and fire resistant home, and it can still be just so aesthetically pleasing. So I'll let Cisco take it over. Yeah, you can have a spectacular garden and still have a wildfire resistant landscape. So the key things to remember is you want a buffer. You don't want, you know, you don't want the forest right up by your house. You're in trouble if you have that. So I think the forest should be 30 feet away and a great plant that is uh, fire resistant that does a good job to make a buffer is a lawn. So if you have a decent lawn, don't forget the water. You don't want that thing to just dry out. Then that's going to make a wonderful buffer. Now, the other thing is you want to try and use plants that are fire resistant. So some plants are fire resistant. Some are fire prone. So I've got a few examples of fire prone plants here with me. And uh, so uh, here's a classic one. This, this is just a little chunk that I just cut off my neighbor's bush. Don't tell them whatever you do. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is an arborvitae. You know, you see these all lined up along the property line. These things are yeah. like torches. They just catch fire. So, you know, if you live in fire-prone country, you probably don't want to use this as a hedge or something, you know. And I wouldn't want to have one any closer than 30 feet from my house. Another, this is the worst of all. And this is the ugliest plant I ever saw anyway, but there are some good <laughs> ones. This is a juniper. 
This is Juniper <laughs> Tam. Look at all the dead wood in there and everything else. And uh, the firefighters call this the gasoline plant. So I think that makes it pretty clear. You don't want that too near your house. Here's a uh, one that'll survive. Yeah. And uh, this is I, rosemary. And uh, I just love rosemary. It's a wonderful plant, but it's also prone to fire. And a lot of plants, you know, when you're thinking about what is fire resistant, you're looking for plants with kind of succulent leaves, don't have a lot of dead wood in them, but also don't have a sap that might flame. And sometimes when they're really strong smelling, that's a sign that uh, that sap might be flammable. So a rosemary is not a good choice for your garden. Surprisingly, though, lavender is great. So uh, you can plant all the lavenders you want. And they're a, a really great fire-resistant plant. Sometimes I don't understand how one is more fire-prone than another. It's hard to say. But um, by the way, for all you guys out there, just so you know, uh, according to English folklore, if you have a beautiful rosemary in your garden, it means a woman is the head of the household. So you don't want any of those things anyway. <laughs> oh, no, no. <laughs> so uh, hey, here's another fire-prone plant, believe it or not. And this is evergreen huckleberry. And boy, from looking at it, you'd never think it's fire-prone, but it's listed in all the lists of fire-prone plants. So you might want to go to those lists on the website before you uh, plant something because this is very fire prone. You wouldn't expect it. But, uh, but now here's a wonderful plant that isn't fire prone. It's fire resistant. So it's lavender. Oh, la, la. I mean, uh, lilac. Oh, la, la. And uh, <laughs> did you notice when I sniffed this, my socks actually started rolling up and down. So... <laughs> okay. So, there's another thing I like to mention. So most, now I got to tell you, I don't live in fire prone uh, country. I'm right in Northeast Seattle. So I get away with almost saying I want, but there's some really important things you could do to help make your uh, landscape more defensible against wildfire. And one is to put in fire breaks. So <clears throat> This stone walkway right here, if the fire's coming through, that's going to uh, really help stop the fire. Uh, so that's one good thing. Uh, water features are really oh, great. great. Now, I have some great water features in here. I'm not sure they would really stop a wildfire. <clears throat> but if you had a water feature like a, like a brook or something that ran along uh, in front of, let's say, uh, a rock wall or something like that, that would be a great fire break, to say the least. Uh, there are some other things that are really important. And one is that in my garden here, I use arborist wood chips for a mulch. And it works really great because uh, it's, it breaks down to make great topsoil and it prevents weeds from growing. Most weed seeds... What? have to be hit by direct sunlight or they won't grow. So if you can put in a, something that stops the sun from hitting the soil where the weed is, you can get a lot less weeds. Uh, but, but if you live in fire prone country, you are not gonna use wood chips or bark for a mulch anywhere near your house. It's quite flammable. So what I like to do is use ground covers. So uh, in fact, if you look at my garden right here, there's a really good example right there of a ground cover I use. When I bought it, it was called Baby Tears. I'm not sure exactly <laughs> what that ground <laughs> cover is called, but it works really good. But look at these cool sedums I found at the nursery this week. So these sedums, Beautiful. they, oh yeah, most of them are hardy. They spread fast. Uh, look at this one. Oh, la, la, I can't wait to plant that. The problem is figuring <laughs> out where to put something this good, you know. And uh, yeah, I brought one other, too. 
sometimes if you can get a ground cover to grow a little taller, this is Angelina, Sedum Angelina. And uh, so this can get about six inches tall, very succulent, holds a lot of water. It's not going to be very fire prone and uh, spreads like uh, spreads like wildfire. So uh, makes a great <laughs> ground cover. A lot of people use um, like uh, gravel for a ground cover. But I got to tell you, if you grow a lot of succulent kind of perennials like I do, you know, they may get scorched if you live where the sun's really hot. So you're better using a ground cover than uh, just gravel, except for maybe right by the house where, you know, under a deck, you never plant anything. It's not worth the risk, you know. There's one other thing I wanted to show. Most, now most conifers are fire prone. Uh, the only ones that aren't western larch is supposed to have really thick bark, and if you keep it cut up high, that, that's supposed to be pretty safe. And ponderosa pine, because again, it has that thick bark, and if you keep them pruned up pretty high, at least 10 right. feet to 20 feet up, that's going to be a lot safer. But most mm -hmm. of your uh, deciduous trees are pretty fire resistant. But well, one thing to look for, and I'll show right here, is that you don't want flaky bark. So uh, this is Acer grissium, or Chinese paper bark maple. It's one of the coolest plants in my garden, and I just love the livid tweedle out of it. They actually <laughs> wrote on this bark in ancient China. They used it as paper. But with something with flaky bark like this, that could catch fire. And that might become fuel in a wildfire. So you want to watch out for that for sure. So now, have I forgot anything? I, I think you, that was great. So one, one thing I wanted to touch on, Cisco, was uh, I've heard that some people will use when they can't necessarily find a ground cover or maybe they're a little nervous with grass, they'll do some gravel and do a little bit of mulch right around it. Because I know you were saying with the scorching of plants, so that's, that's one other option I had heard about. What are, your, yeah, what are some of your thoughts on that? I think that's a great thought. So as long, yeah, if you use gravel and you've got something in there, I'm trying to think of one of my plants, like a geranium or something, and you don't want it to get scorched, yes, you can just make, a, I'd say, about a foot circle around the plant. And you could put in bark or whatever mulch you like there. And then as long as it's just a little island and a sea of gravel, I don't see any problem with that at all. And that'll keep the plant right. from getting scorched. I'm glad you brought that one up. Oh yeah, no worries. Um, yeah, one of, the, one of the other plants that I just wanted to highlight was a blackberry, Himalayan blackberry. That's, that seems to be one noxious weed that sometimes people will plant it because they want the berries, but uh, that has a lot of dead material. So I always try to dissuade people from planting that and it's better not to have the noxious weed anyway. But yeah, yeah, I think I love those, those uh, examples. Those are so great. Well, you know, uh, blackberry, i give you a really cool hint of how to get rid of it, too. So uh, Great. You know, I worked at Seattle University for 24 years. I directed the grounds care. And we had Very vacant cool. lots. We had vacant lots all over the neighborhood. And, uh, well, one of the lots we owned had a building on it, and it was a VA guidance center. I'd go over and do work, and the guy came out one day, and he said, can you do something about that vacant lot next door? And I go, what? What do you mean? <laughs> he said, there's blackberry 20 feet high on both sides of the sidewalk. Someone cut a tunnel through the middle. He said it <laughs> caught, his, caught his trousers and ripped them, you know. So I said, well, <laughs> this isn't my problem, you know. This somebody else owns this land. I'll figure sure, out the right. address and call the city and get the city to come out and make whoever owns this land fix it. Two yeah. days later, I called the city. Two days later, I get called into my boss's office. He goes, somebody <laughs> just squealed on us for some property we own. You got to get rid of those blackberries. I'm like, no. So I didn't know what to do. Made a ton of work. I cut them down to the ground, but you can imagine how many seeds are in there. Now the seeds are being hit by direct sun. It all started to grow back. And I, I didn't use 
uh, herbicides at Seattle U. So I had to figure out a way to solve the problem. I sent one okay. of our assistant gardeners over with an old lawnmower and said, just keep, we cut all the blackberry down to six inches. I said, just keep okay. mowing it so mm -hmm. that the city doesn't get mad at me. <laughs> well, she mowed it every <laughs> two weeks. By the end of summer, not one blackberry left. If you, wow. if you can get that blackberry and cut it down, if you can mow it, you could totally keep the area blackberry free. Uh, it, all the blackberry will die if you mow it every two weeks. Anywhere you can mow it, you have to dig it out. But yeah. oh, it works like a charm. So if people know about that, that's an easy way to get rid of blackberries. Just and just especially get, with everyone being at home now more often, that's that's a great opportunity. I mean, if we all have to be at home, why not not use pesticides? That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, you know, if you got a rider more, that'd be an easy way to do it. Just make sure you got a beer holder on it. And you're off and right. running. <laughs> hey, I want to make, it, make it a good else. time. <laughs> I want to mention something else I forgot to say. And maybe I'll run back over to this garden. But okay, one thing is there's a couple of things here. One, you don't want to, like, we've got these huge trees. By the way, this tree mm -hmm. would red leaves. It's called Chilean fire tree. It's the coolest tree on earth, if I do say so myself. And uh, every hummingbird for 382 miles is on this tree every day. They just love it. But the thing is, if you've got big deciduous trees out in your garden, if all kinds of wood falls down, dead branches fall down and things, you don't want those to build up in your garden because they'll become fuel for a fire. The other thing is you got to make sure you keep your plants watered. You can have a beautiful perennial garden. Most perennials are very fire resistant. Uh, uh, most evergreen shrubs are deciduous shrubs, but you got to keep them well watered and you got to prune them down and get the dead wood out of them because you don't want to leave anything too near your house that's going to be fuel for a fire. The other thing is if you do have some big conifers in your garden, then you probably want to uh, prune those up a bit, you know, limb them up because fire moves low. And that's why fire mm -hmm. breaks are so important. So fire moves low. And so if you can keep those pruned up, those conifers are going to be less likely to catch fire and uh, spread the fire, become fuel for a big fire. Right. I, I think that's a great point, Cisco. Yeah, the, I, we really want to avoid ladder fuel. So that's really what, where that, when that separation doesn't occur between those grasses to the shrubs into the canopy. And if we can make that separation with uh, limbing the trees up and making sure we're removing that dead material, then we don't have the ladder fuel. So yeah, it's really about creating the horizontal and the vertical distance between those fuels. Um, one thing I wanted to, to, to just point out that you mentioned was just that, yeah, if we don't water our lawns, everything is flammable. Everything has the chance to, to catch, catch on fire. Um, all vegetation is flammable if it's dry enough. So thank you for, for pointing that out. Um, and then I also wanted to go back to, to the hedges. Uh, we were talking about how some people use those as fences, but could you also just touch on the importance of potentially having a few feet of non-combustible fencing near your house? Yeah, you betcha. So here we've got this beautiful wood fence, and I love fences because you never have to prune <laughs> them. You hardly ever even have to stain them, you know, they just seem to last forever. But a wood <laughs> fence like this, if, if it touches your house, then it's, it's literally part of your house because the fire can go right, right along the fence, right into the house. So you want, you know, some kind of a big metal gate, some kind of a, a break between the fence and the house, and probably the bigger the better so that there's no way that if the fence catches fire, it's going to go right to your house. That's such an important point. Yeah, thank you for, yeah, really, that's part of the five-foot fuel-free zone around your house. So the fence is also part of it, 100%. Yeah, well, I want to show you one other thing. If, I'm hoping we won't lose Wi-Fi over here, but we'll see. Okay. But I, 
Yeah, but I hope here, not too. <laughs> here is a beautiful fire break. So this is our vegetable garden, and uh, all the stuff's just coming up right now. And that's so fun, vegetable gardening. So people should do it. But uh, here is a wonderful fire break with this stone wall that uh, my uh, wife, my wife Mary, actually built that stone wall. It's I, I can't believe she's strong enough to do it because she doesn't even like Brussels sprouts. But. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so a nice wall like that with a raised bed behind it. You can plant all kinds of cool plants. Everything in there is, uh, except for there's a um, evergreen huckleberry over there. Everything in this garden is pretty much um, fire resistant. So and there, and you'll see that beautiful. there's a a beautiful variegated honeysuckle in there. Tracks hummingbirds all the time and yet is very fire resistant. So a wall like that is a good fire break, especially considering the fire moves low. Yeah, oh, that's, I love that fire break. Mary seems like such an artist. Um, and I, I like that you pointed out that it's a good plan for hummingbirds because a lot of people ask, well, am I still gonna be able to have wildlife in my backyard if it's fire resilient? And yeah, the answer is yes. You can definitely still have places where wildlife habitat exists. And so it's, it's, a, it's really a win-win. Um, oh, it, yeah. it is. And you know, when you have water features, Hummingbirds don't go to still water. They go to moving water. So in our fountain, there's an old man fountain out there. We could go back that way. I'll show that. And <laughs> so uh, hummingbirds love water that moves through the air. So uh, they actually come to that old man fountain's mouth over there, start drinking water, ride it all the way down to the basin, then go back up and do it over and over again. So wow. uh, oh. adding, adding moving water to your garden, uh, the more different kind of plants you have, the more hummingbirds and other birds you're going to attract. And uh, there are so right. many uh, sh shrubs and perennials that attract hummingbirds that are fire resistant. So uh, you can find, you can really have a lot of hummingbirds. Half the time when I come out to work in the garden, I have to wear a hard hat. There's so many hummingbirds out here. <laughs> what a wonderful problem to have. <laughs> oh, yeah, you betcha. <laughs> wow. Uh -huh. Man. Well, this has been great. Thank you so much for showing us around your yard and all of the different things you can do to landscape to make it really beautiful and fire resilient. This is this is awesome. I love the idea of using a water feature too as as something that could be a fire break. It's it's there really is a lot of opportunities to to be creative and how you create these defensible spaces. So yeah, just awesome ideas. <laughs> yeah, you can have a spectacularly beautiful garden, and it's not hard to come up with neat water features, you know, and uh, the sound of water is so wonderful. Mm -hmm. And uh, At our house, we eat all our dinners, spring, summer, and fall, outdoors on our patio, and patios wow. are nice fire breaks, too, so <laughs> it's great. Yeah, right. <laughs> so many benefits. Oh, wonderful. Well, great. Well, thank you so much, Cisco. This has been really awesome, and I really appreciate all your expertise and time that you are willing to share with us today. This is this is just great. Well, thank you so much. I really enjoyed doing it. And everybody, uh, make sure that you take good care of your landscape, water it enough, and give yourself a buffer, and then you'll feel safe in your home. <laughs>